So good afternoon, everyone, and today's briefing. Once again, we have a new face at our table. Today joining us is Brenda Hurls, and she's joining Minister Agee and Dr. Fitzgerald with me today. Now, Brenda's a, uh, an infection control nurse specialist and has been working with Dr. Fitzgerald uh, in a few minutes to show us how to properly wear a mask. Now, over the last few weeks, we've seen lots of people reaching out with questions about wearing masks. Uh, we've heard questions about what kind of mask, material, how to wear it, and how to make your own. But before we get into this, I want to talk about how this is used to protecting your families and, and about physical distancing and, and other things like hand washing. These are simple things that we can do in our daily routines. And one of the things that we often talk about is physical distancing and maintaining this six feet, this two meters or a fathom, as Minister Agee often refers to. But also we don't talk enough about the effectiveness of hand washing in warm water for some 20 to 30 seconds. This is very effective. And I know I find my own self quite often much more than I would in the past of washing my hands on a regular basis. But when that's not available, keep in mind that we have a proper hand sanitizers, and that must be at a 60% alcohol base. We also know the importance of the numbers of guidelines that the Dr. Fitzgerald has put in place. We can't say it enough about staying home, maintaining safe physical distancing, covering your face when coughing and sneezing, and avoid touching your face, your mouth, your nose, your eyes, as an example. And we can't forget the important guideline of about essential travel, travel only when necessary. Uh, the global health pandemic, as we all know, has changed the lives of many people in all our communities. As you can tell just by the coverage that we get on our news channels on a daily basis. And it is a top priority for all levels of government, the federal government, the provincial government, and indeed our communities. And all of this is keeping safety uh, front in mind. Uh, just last week, the federal government announced some additional measures, and of course, this was around air passengers, people that travel with air, airplanes, and this was about non-medical masks or face coverings, as I just mentioned, for your mouth and your nose during travel. So to all of us, the question was, well, what does this mean? Uh, so if you've cleared the essential travel, and you have, uh, so what you do is you have to cover your mouth and you have to cover your nose. So this is specifically at Canadian airport screening checkpoints, and we know there that it's very difficult, if you're being properly screened, it's very difficult to maintain uh, safe physical distancing. But it's also for those that travel on ferries and in buses around our province as well. So what it comes down to is about protecting yourselves and protecting others around you uh, when you cannot maintain safe physical distancing when traveling. So given this new measure, we thought it would be appropriate today to go back to some of the bases of show and tell, and we'll get a demonstration how you can wear a mask. So I'll now pass it over to Dr. Fitzgerald for the daily update and then the introduction now to uh, wearing a mask properly for yours, protection of those of your family. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for everyone joining us online uh, today. As usual, I'll start with an update. Um, since the media briefing yesterday, we have no new positive cases of COVID-19. The total number of cases in our province remains at 257. By region, we have 239 cases in Eastern Health, eight cases in Central Health, four in Western, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. 52% of cases are female and 48% are male. By age, there are 22 people under the age of 20, 37 people between 20 and 39, 37 between 40 and 49, 56 between 50 and 59, 58 between 60 and 69, and 47 who are 70 and above. Six people are in hospital due to the virus, and of these patients, two are in intensive care. 194 people have now recovered, and in total we have tested 6,431 people. No new cases to report over the last couple of days is indeed promising, but we must remain cautious with our optimism. I cannot stress enough that we are not yet in the clear. COVID-19 is still in our province, and we must do everything we can to reduce its spread. 
Although we are not yet near the finish line, our slow and steady approach will ensure we win this race. Our continued public health efforts are now more important than ever to stop this virus and prevent new cases. We can do this and we will do this together. I know it has not been easy, but please continue to follow the public health measures in place. Stay at home as much as possible and only go out for essentials once a week. Maintain a safe physical distance from others. Wash your hands often and well. Cover your coughs and sneezes and stay at home if you are not feeling well. Our collective efforts are working. Please keep this momentum going. <clears throat> We continue to receive many questions from the public about the proper use of non-medical masks and particularly how to apply and remove them. Today we will do a demonstration and provide you with guidance in this regard. While there is still much to be learned about COVID-19, it appears that many people who are infected shed the virus before they start feeling sick and others who have the virus may never feel symptoms but may still play a role in transmitting it. So I'd like to remind people that while wearing a non-medical mask, such as a homemade cloth mask, hasn't been proven to protect the person wearing it, it can be an additional measure to protect others around you by preventing your respiratory droplets from contaminating others or landing on surfaces. It can be particularly beneficial uh, when shopping for essentials or using pu public transit. If you do wear a mask, ensure it is well fitted without any gaps and avoid adjusting it often or touching your face. Please also be mindful that masks can become contaminated on the outside when touched by hands and should not be shared with others. So as the Premier said, we have enlisted the help of Brenda Earls, an infection prevention and control registered nurse specialist and a valued member of our public health team at the Department of Health and Community Services. And Brenda is going to help demonstrate. So before you put on your cloth mask, make sure you clean your hands either with soap and water for 20 seconds or you can use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer as Brenda is doing. Masks can have ear loops or strings to secure them. We'll start the demonstration with an ear loop type mask. When your hands are clean and dry, pick up your mask by the ear loops. Touch your mask as little as possible. Pick up one loop and place it over one ear. Then place the other loop over your other ear. Now is the time for you, adjust the, for you to adjust the mask to make sure it is over your nose and pulled down underneath your chin and is completely covering your face as much as possible. Some cloth masks have a wire to tighten it over the nose. Remember, once you have adjusted your mask with your clean hands, avoid touching it again while wearing it. You have to be very attentive and not touch your face or the mask. This helps to stop the spread of COVID-19. Also, you must keep your mask on while you're talking to others. A common question people ask is when you should remove the mask. So you should take it off when you can maintain social distancing and you can clean your hands and have a safe place to dispose of your mask for washing. So first clean your hands as Brenda is doing, then remove your mask only touching the loops. Don't pull it off from the front and throw it directly into the laundry or if you are not at home into a bag designated for that purpose. Clean or dispose of the bag when you get home. Then wash your hands again. And now we will demonstrate for a mask with ties. So as Brenda has just done, first clean your hands. Hold the mask by the top strings. Place it over your nose, then tie the top strings behind your head. This takes a little bit longer. Next, tie the bottom strings behind your neck to secure. Now is the time for you to adjust the mask to make sure it is over your nose and pulled down underneath your chin and completely covering your face as much as possible. Again, some ma cloth masks have a wire to tighten it over the nose. 
Once again, it is important to remember to avoid touching your mask or face while wearing it. To remove this mask, clean your hands. Untie the bottom strings first. Next, untie the top strings. Again, don't pull it off from the front. Hold it by the strings and throw it directly into the laundry or if you are not at home, into a bag designated for that purpose. Clean or dispose of the bag, then wash your hands again. As a final note, please remember that wearing a mask is not a replacement for the proven public health measures of proper hand hygiene and physical distancing. Please continue to adhere to those measures. Thank you for the demonstration, Brenda. And Premier, I turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. And I will say that Brenda is uh, one example of so many great people that we have working with us, you know, largely behind the scenes and supporting the work that we're doing on your behalf. And what a great tutorial today to show us how to properly wear a mask. As uh, Dr. Fitzgerald has said, no new cases. Uh, this is three days in a row, but let's keep in mind we've had 13 cases within the, the last week, so we cannot let up. We had to stay the course and continue to follow the guidelines you know, that she has put in place. But I do want to say thank you for all of those of you that are compliant and following the guidelines as Dr. Fitzgerald has done. And I do believe there's a recognition that, as she said, we must keep the momentum. We will get there, but we must continue to stay the course. We know that the virus is still among us. It's a resident of our province. It's in our communities. And the only way that it travels is it travels with you. So let's stop this thing dead in its tracks before it gets a chance once again to wreak havoc on our communities. So I want to take a moment or two to talk about a couple new measures that the Prime Minister announced just a few moments ago. Uh, we said yesterday that this was uh, Volunteer Week. And one of the measures that he announced today was one of around emergency community support fund. This is for charities and not for and not profits. And this will help deliver essential services for people that are facing the highest impacts of this uh, COVID-19. So the announcement was some $305 million, and you'll get uh, some local and national organizations. A couple examples would be uh, groups like the Red Cross and the United Way. And these are groups that are strategically positioned to get to some of our most vulnerable rather quickly. And they could be anything from helping you deliver groceries, medications, or transportation for services for seniors or some of the persons with disabilities within our communities. We also know that uh, the second announcement that he talked about today was about some of the businesses in our communities that are having a big impact and find it difficult today. So one of the measures that he announced today was to help business owners. And of course, we know coming out of this health crisis, it's those small businesses primarily that will be positioned to create employment and put people back to work within our province. So the federal government is setting up a portal on the CRA website, that's the Canada Revenue Agency website, and that is where business can go and calculate what the wage subsidy will, will cover. Applications will be open for a Monday, the April the 27th, that's next week, and the maximum benefit would be some $847 per employee each week. If you want to look at our own website, the COVID-19 website, this will include the federal supports and keep you updated on all the recent information that we have as a province and on behalf of the federal government as well. We all know that this is another example by working together that we will stop the spread and we will get through this pandemic as a province and as a, and as a people. So let's continue to be responsible in our own actions. And once again, I want to thank Dr. Fitzgerald and thank Brenda for the lesson that we received today on proper fitting of a mask. So it's a great takeaway for everyone in our province of all ages who would like to take the additional measure of protecting yourselves and your families. I now turn it over to uh, Minister Hagee uh, for his comments for today. Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and uh, thank you to Brenda as well for uh, <clears throat> demonstrating yet another skill when she's not writing policy or giving flu vaccines, uh, she is uh, helping educators about masks. It reminds me of a, a previous career. The low numbers this week are uh, comforting. However, uh, I think two things need to be said. One is they really represent uh, good uh, basic skills and resources within the province 
in old-fashioned, old-style public health measures. Shoe leather contact tracing has been the way we have uh, uh, found and identified uh, all of the individuals who have uh, been affected by COVID-19. I think it's really important now uh, that with the new testing criteria, anybody who has two of the symptoms listed should uh, make the effort to go and get tested. Um, people may feel these are trivial symptoms, and indeed they are very common at this time of the year because they share commonalities with common cold uh, and with flu. Uh, and as I've said before, this province experiences a second flu spike around this time of the year. Um, we uh, promote drive-through uh, clinic testing, but for those people who do not have uh, transport, uh, 811 will ask you, about transport and if you don't have your own then alternatives can be suggested that would suit your particular circumstance i was speaking to a friend of mine today who actually went uh, and got tested uh, there was one vehicle ahead of her in the line the entire process took maybe two minutes uh, the administrative details had all been taken down over the phone beforehand uh, and apart from making her eyes water uh, she described it as a very efficient process uh, and not one to be at all concerned about in terms of actually going and getting tested. So again, I would encourage that. That will uh, provide us with the most accurate, up-to-date information and help us identify those people with fairly mild symptoms who yet may still carry the virus around. Because as the Premier said, this virus is one of the latest emigrants to Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's here. Um, one of the challenges we are now starting to face is uh, a request from the public uh, and from businesses to consider how best to get back to normal. And I think the first thing I would have to say is that you need to reset your expectations as to what normal will be henceforth. This virus, even under ideal circumstances, will be a feature of our lives for the next 18 months to two years. And that's under the best of circumstances. There is a new normal coming. We are working on a plan uh, we are looking at the tools we will put in that plan that will help uh, reduce the impact of COVID-19, will help control its spread and allow some resumption uh, of the broader activities of life that we have uh, put aside for the last three or four weeks. Uh, it's a whole-of-government approach, and that's why it's going to take every department in government, be it education, uh, business, uh, advanced education, skills and labour, women's policy office, whatever. There's no realm of government that will not be affected by this. So a significant level of coordination is required. And the one characteristic we're all going to need over the next three or four weeks is patience. Because even under the best of circumstances, even under the best of circumstances, this virus will still affect people. People will still get sick. And there may yet be more serious illness and even fatality as we go through this process of trying to define a new normal for Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, even with uh, a, a good plan, uh, we will probably end up reinstating some of the measures that we relax. That is not a failure. That is an acknowledgement that the virus is now part of our life for the little while uh, between now and uh, and at least a vaccine that we know will work. That is work going on, uh, and that work will take however long it takes, no matter under ideal or accelerated circumstances. You're still looking at months before any substantive trials will be available in this country. So again, I think the message is we have to hold the line. We need to realize that while winning a, a kind of peace with this vaccine, has been difficult with the lockdown. Maintaining that peace and coming to terms with living with the vaccine is actually, in my view, going to be harder than what we've had to do for the last four or five weeks. It is not going to be simple, and there are going to be occasions where, even with the best of plans, we will have to look at bringing in or bringing back measures that we thought we could have dispensed with. The best defense against COVID-19 is, so, is physical distancing. We can keep socially connected, and that is crucial because we are a social province. But we need to keep our distance. We need to hold that line. And as I've said before, 
We need to create a bubble for ourselves and our families. We need to protect that bubble, and we need to avoid bursting anyone else's. Now more than ever, it is important that we do not give up and we do not lose patience, because if we do, we will go backwards. Uh, with that, Premier, I'll hand it back to you for uh, uh, the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Minister. And indeed, we are a social province, and the message from the Minister, of course, is we must continue to hold the line. I now turn it over to the media for uh, their questions for this afternoon. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have six reporters registered for today's call. In the essence of time for today, each reporter will ha ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest that you do not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues all other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order in which they registered for today's call. We will run through the telephone queue, and I will call on each reporter by name to ask questions. Please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, reporters will be individually asked for single questions. This call will end at 2.59 p.m., and further questions can be emailed. For the benefit of our viewing audience, we will present a short animation video that has been developed here within the government at the end of the question and answer session. Please stay tuned in because I know you're going to really enjoy it. Our first questions today are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, We've seen uh, the price of oil plunge to kind of the new depths in the past few days. Um, you know, how does this factor into your long-term planning for, for the province? And you know, if we see this bottom out price of oil uh, continue over a long period of time, are we going to have to look at uh, cutting services? Are there going to be cutbacks to services in Newfoundland Labrador? Yes. Right now, what we're seeing here is a collapse in oil prices around the world. We've seen West Texas Intermediate yesterday go at a minus thirty-eight dollars. Storage is at capacity. Tanks are full. Even tankers themselves are full, and so uh, demand is down around the world. So it's needless to say this is a very difficult time when it comes to uh, oil prices and to provinces like Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, you know, that depend on those revenues. So right now we will continue to work with the federal government, continue to work with the other provinces, but our plans right now is to hold a course, get through this health crisis, and make sure that we're prepared when we come out of this to deal with uh, the economic crisis, that not just the oil prices, but all the other collapse in revenues that we're seeing are in Newfoundland and Labrador. I will say that, you know, we've been very, uh, we were having some good discussions with the federal government on programs, you know, that could actually reflect the current needs of our province, given the collapse in oil prices. You know, just uh, moments before coming down here, we saw our own Brent, uh, Brent uh, oil at less than $20 a barrel. So it's needless to say it's having a tremendous impact on the revenue stream for our province. Um, last uh, last week, the seniors advocate recommended uh, more regular inspections for long-term care facilities. Um, how often are these inspections being conducted right now, and, and has their frequency increased uh, since her since her comments last week? From the point of view, Patrick, of inspections of long-term care facilities, uh, regional health authorities are responsible for what we refer to as long-term care facilities. They're an integral part of the hospital. They're accredited by, health, uh, by Accreditation Canada every four years, uh, and they have managers and patient safety individuals responsible on a day-to-day -day basis for supervision of uh, patient care and, and, and dietary needs. The area which is um, outside of the RHA is the personal care home, which uh, cater for clients who have slightly lesser care needs. We've certainly been involved much more frequently uh, in visiting those facilities and providing advice. Uh, our concern is around simply the fact that these are areas we really need to protect uh, from any chance of uh, ch uh, infection by COVID-19. So we've been very careful about the way we carry out our monitoring to try and minimize the number of people who do visit. Uh, in terms of the kinds of visits that they get, they have nutritional requirements, they have menu requirements, and often these can be done by, uh, by distance. Uh, certainly in terms of clinical and care needs, there are caregivers who do have to visit uh, personal care homes to actually provide that hands-on care. So there is frequent interaction, but 
it's done solely with the lens of trying to minimize the risks of the people inside. Uh, but but given that uh, there are lots of less, there are a lot less people visiting these these, these facilities, and given the, the recommendation from the uh, seniors advocates, have have you uh, increased that level of oversight? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Could you elaborate at all? Well, I mean, what 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 elements would you like to know? We can get you a list of of numbers from regional health authorities. Uh, in terms of who visits, but there are a variety of people who go in there. There are social workers, there are dietitians, community dietitians, there are uh, nursing care providers, there is administrative oversight through the directors of, uh, uh, of um, uh, long-term and personal care, uh, community care, I think it's called, in the regional health authorities. So, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can certainly provide you with a list of those. I don't have those numbers on hand. We don't do a regular schedule outside of our normal uh, quarterly and monthly um, reconciliation. So every personal care home has some level of assessment every month. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson of the Telegram. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, when contacts are traced, public health officials. Uh, how is confidentially handled? And what I'm wondering specifically is, are, are these contacts warned not to divulge information that they may glean from that contact, such as the source and all that sort of thing? Uh, so contact tracing is done, uh, well, not anonymously, but it's certainly done without, um, without releasing information about the uh, uh, about the person that the contact was in contact with. So uh, the way it's addressed is that, I mean, obviously, if it's within families, that's a different uh, different story. If it's within the same household, obviously, everyone knows who everyone is. Uh, but if we're going outside of that, what uh, what will happen is that the, the nurse who's, who's uh, reaching out to that contact will say, you have been identified as a contact of somebody who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, and, uh, and then they... Uh, talk to them about symptoms and uh, uh, talk to them about testing. And if they come back positive, then they do contact tracing with them. Um, and But there's no release of information, uh, uh, private uh, patient information to a contact uh, unless the person releases that information uh, themselves or if it's a parent and child situation or a, a caregiver type of situation. Um, uh, substitute decision maker, that sort of thing, um, then those those uh, privacy bounds are still in place when it comes to contact tracing. Okay, thank you. Um, and Premier, I wanted to ask you about small businesses. I know the federal government is uh, planning to offer some kind of a relief uh, in short order, but uh, we understand that many businesses have rent queue on the 1st of May. Is the province willing to implement a moratorium on eviction in that well, kind of situation, at least a temporary one? Yeah, so we, uh, when we opened the house up there a, a few weeks ago now, there were some changes to the Residential Tenancy Act, and I think what you're talking about here would be something, around, some measures around commercial rents maybe. So we're, yeah. after, we're having discussions now with the federal government about some relief for uh, commercial rent holders, and as you work in conjunction with the, the tenants, the landlords, and with the various financial institutions that, you know, that hold these mortgages. So you know, we're getting very close to this, and this will mean a partnership between the federal government, the provinces, and those uh, many small businesses. That are, you're, you're right. You're, you're feeling the, the impact, the negative impact of this pandemic on their businesses, as well as now the portal will be opened up for many of those small businesses now to receive applications to support uh, their, uh, their payroll. Okay. Um, and just as a follow to that, we'll be working with municipalities to provide relief for small businesses from property taxes because that's not the kind of thing municipal, municipalities can necessarily afford. Well, right now we, uh, you know, there's obviously ongoing discussions when, when need be 
on what level of community supports would be required. You know, our objective right now would be at the provincial level and working with the federal government to put in place the, uh, the supports that would be required. There's a lot of work that goes into getting those programs in place, making sure the portals are open, making sure that, uh, you know, that the information is available and you can quickly turn around the support that's required. And let's keep in mind that this, uh, that, uh, this was not even a pandemic until May the, uh, March the 11th of this year, and here we are now just about you know, six, seven weeks into this, and we're quickly pr providing supports for business owners, for many of our uh, employees, and for many people in this province you know, that are disadvantaged already, and they're feeling the impact of this. So we're, it's, it's a lot of work going into this, and hopefully when this portal gets opened up, we'll get some relief for businesses as well next week. Thank you. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Um, we're hearing a lot from mental health uh, workers who take um, calls to helpline, um, that they're seeing a lot of increased calls because of COVID, um, and they warn of mental health crisis, including a spike in death by suicide, are possible outcomes because of this. What prevention work, other than access to helplines, is being done? Uh, it's a very good question, and certainly we know from Snowmageddon, which really only lasted in the localized area, albeit a populous one, uh, for a week or so, that we saw an uptick in calls. Certainly, we have made sure Channel and the Warm Line are well resourced. We've also bolstered our regular uh, crisis line. In terms of um, uh, system changes, uh, Bridge the Gap. Uh, .ca has uh, access portals for children and youth and for adults uh, with anything from mental wellness to stress relief and anxiety relief uh, tools uh, right, the through, right the way through to uh, therapists available online. Uh, one of the things we did do that wasn't in the previous pandemic plan because the world has changed a bit since then is we deemed doorways our walking clinics an essential service. So they are in uh, maybe as many as 70 communities. Uh, the challenge there is it's face-to-face, -face, but it is drop-in and it is personalized, uh, and it's an hour of counseling without an appointment. Um, we're keeping an eye on those to see if there's any evidence of any um, resource limitations there. But thus far, uh, we haven't been made aware of any through the RHA. So um, a suite of options there. Uh, and from the medical end of things, um, uh, you know, physicians, primary care uh, practitioners are available for urgent and emergent uh, consults, be they virtual or face-to-face. -face. And I'm told that the mental health world, the virtual consult, particularly the ones with video, have become uh, quite popular uh, uh, and well-received. But equally, you know, psychiatry and mental health services at the kind of tertiary level are, are also still available as they were before. My understanding is they are not uh, I'm not hearing that they are having any particular uh, challenges in one area or another. Thank you. And I'm looking for some clarification on the testing that's being done. We had um, announced today 6,400, just over 6,400 tested. Do those that were tested, so it's roughly 200 since yesterday, are those with results back or are we still waiting on results of those that were being tested? So depending on when they were tested, um, but anyone who was uh, tested yesterday, we would have their results back by now. Uh, anyone who was tested early this morning, we probably have their results back by now as well, but anyone who was tested a little bit later, we may not have those results at this time. Uh, but that's a very fluid number, as you can imagine. Um, the, the lab is putting these tests through on a regular basis. Um, so uh, the pending results will always be there because there, there are always going to be pending results. And, uh, and that's a very fluid number. No, for sure. The other, thing, the other thing, Kellyanne, is in actual fact the number of patients tested is actually lower than the number of tests that are actually done. There is a gap of around 300 tests there, so that the number of tests actually done by the laboratory may actually be up around 6,700. I can get you that precise figure, but there are situations where patient and individual may have more than one test because it's clinically indicated over the course of an illness or an episode. So um, the number of people tested is actually lower slightly than the number of tests actually done. Oh, okay, great. Great clarification, thank you. 
Um, and yesterday, Minister Hagee, you mentioned that Dr. Rahman and his team would begin to insert the numbers over the past 10 days. Uh, do we have an update on that modeling coming or a, a timeline on when, I guess, people of the province can expect to see the new numbers in tables? We're working on that. and We hope to be able to uh, let you know when that will come out uh, within the next 24 hours in terms of notifying you when it would be available. But that's certainly something that uh, Dr. Rahman's team is, is currently engaged in. And I know uh, he's been given some new data uh, fairly recently. Thank you. Our next questions are from Ben Murphy of BOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Premier, the Department of Education says no firm decision has been made on the closure of schools for the rest of the year, yet all final and public exams have been cancelled. Progress reports are coming out tomorrow. Those grades can go up but not down. We're not even sure about a September return yet. And I know the plan was released by the NLESD there on April 2nd, but there's only one small mention of a possible return this year among all the other things that point to no return. So I guess why have we not just made the firm decision to outright keep schools closed for the year with this plan that's in place and then focus on a return for September? Well, the big focus so far uh, is to make sure that we have continuing learning processes in place. And as I mentioned yesterday, the marks on April the 22nd will be the, uh, the marks. And then, you know, students can work to see improvements. Uh, on those marks and this is really about continuing the learning process for the rest of the year as opposed to making a decision today about whether whether schools will be closed permanently or not i mean as you as you just outlined you know given where we are today it's you know it's unlikely but you know yet we haven't made the final decision given on where we are with this but we'd encourage students there's your opportunity when you get your progress reports, continue to work hard, continue to work, and make sure that you can do whatever you can to bring those marks up higher uh, than you receive on the 22nd. We have teachers there ready to support you, and we have mechanisms in place even in some of our smaller communities to support those students. Yeah, I, I know that like the continuous learning is important, and I'm, I'm not questioning that at all. I'm just, I'm just questioning on why we're not making a firm decision on the closure of schools when there are some teachers who are kind of wondering, you no, know, I don't know if I might have to go back in two or three Mondays' time. Well, the teachers are working with students now, so it's really about the location of where they work from. They work from their homes and support of students. So it's not as if the teachers are not there supporting the students. It's really about the location. And right now, they were not, we cannot make a decision if it's safe to go back to school this year. And so making the decision to be in a school setting or working from home, really it's, it's about support of the students. So our focus is making sure we do whatever we can for the students to get them in a better position to, if indeed schools are ready to open again in September, or those that will be graduating this year and going to a post-secondary education. So it's really not about the location. It's about the learning for the students that require that either for next September or in the K-12 system or in some post-secondary institution. And, Minister Hagee, you've insisted that paramedics are equipped well with PPE, yet I've heard from some in private and community-based services, uh, which are relied pretty heavily on in rural areas, to say they don't have the appropriate PPE. They said they're not getting enough from the RHAs. They last even a day in some cases. Um, this came from the West Coast. What do you say to them? Well, my understanding is that the regional health authorities work with the owner and operator of private ambulance companies or the, uh, the uh, uh, community ambulance groups. Now, uh, I've not been made aware through the RHAs that there is any demand that is not being met. And maybe there's a breakdown somewhere uh, that has um, led to miscommunications or lack of communications between frontline paramedics uh, and the supply chain. As again, if you have a specific example, we would be happy to look into that. But the RHA have kits available for those private operators whose own supply chain has let them down. And all they have to do is ask. Okay, perfect. I'll fire off an email after this. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Peggy, I want to pick up on a comment that you made earlier talking about 18 months to two years that we're going to be living with some sort of restrictions. A lot of people, it creates a lot of anxiety for people. I'm wondering, can you give us an idea, what are some of the measures that you would consider more short-term measures that we're likely to start lifting soon, and what are some of the measures that would be considered more long-term? Well, that's a very interesting question, because no one's been down this road in any scientific way yet uh, that we can report. There are experiences experiments ongoing in various jurisdictions in Europe where they're toying with should you start with the schools first, 
should you start with um, uh, with uh, businesses, and if so, what? So the answer to that question is we're going to look and see. We know we have to have a plan, and we know that plan has to be flexible. The time frame of 18 months to two years is predicated on um, the amount of time it would take to develop an effective vaccine, get that manufactured and get that out there uh, in a way that makes sense. Uh, I mean, we have a flu vaccination program. Every year we, we push this, and yet less than, uh, less than 40% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians actually take this vaccine outside the year of the H1N1 pandemic, where the numbers were considerably better. Uh, but the facts of the case are, this is going to be uh, potentially a virus that could change each year. It is in the same kind of biological family as influenza. And what this year's vaccine works on, next year uh, you'll need a different vaccine to, uh, to, um, to deal with. So that's where the time frame comes from. In terms of what you do next, we keep an eye on Norway, we keep an eye on um, you know, Denmark, but we're also looking at mathematical models. There are simulations that are being run by Public Health Agency of Canada. Dr. Rahman's group as well will be moving on to that uh, if they haven't already started to see if they can do uh, agent-based simulation, compartmentalized models, these kind of things that will say, well, if we take this area of society and open it up, what effect could that have in terms of the return of the virus? Because as I said earlier on, this virus, no matter what we do, people still will get sick. What we have to do is try and reduce that number and reduce that risk as far as possible. And so uh, it's going to be a slow process. So, Peter, I think if we go back to what happened, you know, to the world really around travel with, uh, with 9-11, as travelers people adapted uh, to the new requirements around travel, and I think as, you know, the minister quite rightly points out is, you know, this virus is around. So as a society, we will have to find a way not to wait it out, but to adapt to the new realities of COVID-19. So it really will come down to adaptation. How we adjust our lifestyles uh, to get back to what the new normal is. Very similar to what we did around 9-11, we will make, uh, we will adapt to uh, COVID-19. What is the earliest that we might start to see some of the current restrictions being lifted? That again is a modeling exercise. Um, in terms of what other jurisdictions are doing, some of them have simply said um, a rate below a certain level per day, pick a number, because you can justify or not almost any number, uh, for a period of, of 14 days. And the 14 days is based around the incubation period of this virus. So, um, you know, we're into a period now where we've had five days, uh, maybe six, of numbers that you could justify as being low. We still have not passed that window where Easter could still adversely affect our figures. So the absolute earliest would be at the beginning of May and maybe even you know a little bit later than that. But again, the plan has to be in place. And you have to realize that it's going to be harder to undo this state of emergency and the lockdown than it was actually to institute it. Because at the end of the day, you're talking about behavioral change as well as public health. And whatever we do, it is highly likely that someone else will get COVID-19 and someone else may get very sick from it. And we just have to be conscious of that and reduce the chance as best we can. But there is no avenue out of this that is not risk-free. From modeling, we know one of the key metrics to look at is for every person who gets sick, how many people are they infecting? Obviously, the higher the number, the, the faster it spreads. What is the number that we're looking at right now, and how has that changed? So at the moment... The last one we had from Dr. Rahman was an R0 of around 1.3 to 1.5. What that means in terms of the way you describe it is every person who gets it will pass it on to one and a half other people. Dr. Fitzgerald, it sounds like you want to jump in. Uh, I was going to say that, you know, if we're, if we're talking about um, 
uh, releasing restrictions than our R naught has to be quite low, uh, less than one for sure, and uh, and it has to be maintained at that level for a, a period of time, and that changes as as obviously the epidemiology changes. Um, so, um, you know, things look good right now, but but we do have to be, as the minister said, we have to be cautious about uh, um, about the two week period from Easter and. Uh, and uh, other things as well. And as we release restrictions, then we are likely going to see an increase in cases. So those are all things that we have to take into consideration before we can consider any of this. Thank you. Our next questions are from Elizabeth Witt of All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. I'm, I'm curious, with the increase in testing, does that mean more contact tracing is going to be performed? And Will you need to bring on more staff for that role? So uh, more testing will find m more cases in all likelihood. Uh, and so it, with every case that we find, we have to do contact tracing. Uh, you know, we've had a, a, a very large cluster uh, with the funeral home cluster, and we uh, were quite successful in doing contact tracing with that. And in fact, one of the reasons, uh, probably the most important reason uh, that we got that cluster under control was because of public health's work doing contact tracing. Um, they were very good, very efficient at doing that. And uh, so we found those people, we got them out of the system, and we prevented them from spreading it to others. Uh, so we are, you know, we have a good capacity for public health. Uh, certainly in some areas they have talked about training other people to do some of some aspects of the contact tracing that's not to say that they would do all contact tracing and certainly it is a it is a very skilled um, process uh, but uh, you know we would consider if we uh, were to look at a situation where it looked like cases were increasing and we needed to increase contact tracing capacity uh, then certainly we're open to all those possibilities thank you and I was wondering also, how has contact tracing changed over the course of the pandemic, especially as we now know of asymptomatic spread? Uh, so initially when we started uh, looking at this disease, you know, we were um, fairly certain that uh, symptomatic spread was the main driver, and we still are fairly certain that that is the main driver, uh, but we have come to realize that uh, there is pre-symptomatic spread, so some people may uh, be contagious in the day, a couple of days prior to developing symptoms. Uh, and there have been some uh, reports of people never getting sick, uh, but still being able to transmit the disease. So uh, because of that, we did change that the, the way that we um, traced contacts and we went back a couple of days before people started getting symptoms. Uh, it also changed the way that we tested some of those contacts in Previously, we would have looked at only testing symptomatic people, but some of those close contacts who were not symptomatic or were ended up being pre-symptomatic, but were not symptomatic at the time that uh, we recommended that they be tested as well. So, so you, this has been a, um, a process where we've been learning as we go in some respects, uh, but there has been a lot of good information out there that we've been able to rely on as well. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that, can you say how many people have been interviewed in the contact tracing process? Uh, I don't have a definitive number of that, but there, I mean, we've had, you know, 257 cases, so it's it's been hundreds of people that have been interviewed. Thank you. We'll now take some single questions, uh, but I will caution the reporters that when we get to about three minutes before uh, 2.59, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop the uh, question play the video. Our first question is from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Premier, uh, St. Pierre Michelon opened its uh, crab fishery this week, and uh, crab quotas for Newfound Labrador were announced yesterday. Um, do you support pushing the crab fishery uh, back until the 11th of May, as suggested by the FFAW? So right now, there's ongoing work between the Department, the National, the Federal Department of uh, uh, fisheries and oceans and people of uh, community groups like the and union uh, stakeholders like the FFAW and so they are working very closely together of course the the province you know primarily the big focus for us would be on the processing side so they are working with the FFAW right now uh, 
Uh, what FFAW did, as, has been asking for is a delay, uh, not a suspension or not a cancellation of the crab fishery. So right now, uh, they're working very closely together. And in any, as with any industry, the only thing that we would support is that you be able to do it in a, a safe manner, making sure that you follow the guidelines that have been put in place by the chief medical officer. But those groups are, uh, are working together. And the FFAW right now are recommending or asking for a delay. It's not a suspension or a cancellation. It's a delay at this moment. Our next question is from Peter Jackson of the Telegram. Please go ahead. Your Hi. Is not open. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious to know, you, would be, would you talk about, uh, Minister Hagee, you talk about a, a second wave of flu that often happens around this time. Uh, is that second wave actually happening? Because you think on lockdown and so physical distancing and stuff, we wouldn't see a lot of colds or flus or anything, let alone COVID-19. Uh, that's an excellent question, Peter. It also gives me the opportunity to apologize to my colleague, Dr. Fitzgerald, for interrupting her earlier on. It's the, the lag of the Skype technology, so uh, please forgive my manners. Um, it, it's an interesting observation. We do publish on a weekly basis a bulletin throughout the flu season with our numbers. The next one, I think, is probably due out on, uh, on Friday of this week. Um, it, it's hard to know... Um, without comparing directly uh, whether or not we've had an impact on flu. And quite honestly, it will be interesting to plot that out over the course of the rest of the season to see what changes there may have been. Certainly as of last week, I think we had about 684 identified cases of influenza. Um, we'd had um, more people hospitalized with flu in ICU than we've actually had hospitalized anywhere with COVID-19. And we'd had more fatalities uh, than we've seen with COVID-19. Uh, and that's an interesting statement, particularly when you go back to previous questions. Everyone's hanging on for a vaccine. We have absolutely awful adult vaccination rates in this province. We're great with our kids. We're one of the best in the country, if not the best in the, the, the developed world. But for adults, for vaccination against the flu, we stop. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. We're pretty well 10 days out of Easter here. When can we start to see some of the results of what people may or may not have done that weekend? Um, so the average incubation period of this is uh, about five, six days. So uh, we would have expected to see some symptoms uh, coming up by now, but it can be up to 14 days. So we still have a few days before we can say we're in the clear from Easter. Thank you. The next question is from Ben Murphy of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, are there any regulations in place around those working in group homes who may have to work in more than just one home, similar to the long-term care situation, and if not, why not? Certainly, uh, Ben. We, we uh, Group homes are, uh, are, are maybe, may mean different things to different people, uh, but those uh, areas where there are um, people in a residence for whom care is required. Some of them uh, fall under the regional health authorities uh, and some of them do not. So for those that do, certainly we have uh, made every effort to see uh, what can be done and what should be done to cut down on that cross-movement of people. Uh, we've also been working with CSSD uh, and their department to see if there is an impact uh, of that ruling or that order uh, on, on their department. And at the moment, we're still working our way through it. Um, home support in general has been the most challenging area around this, simply because of the fragmented nature of it, where 40% of our home support is actually provided through what's called self-managed or direct managed uh, care, where the client themselves organizes their care workers. The agencies are a little easier to, to deal with because there's only... 30, 35 of them rather than uh, a lot of bodies, as it were. So it, it's something we're conscious of and something we're, we're working through. Uh, they are a regulated area, but whether the regulations would impinge directly on this because of the way the order's written, we're working out. I think we have time for one more question. Peter Cowan of CBC News. 
for Elizabeth Witten, if you could email me your final question, that would be great. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, yeah, Dr. Hagee, uh, PEI has just announced May 1st they're going to start easing some of their restrictions. Uh, what's the timeline for coming up with some of the specific measures and the specific timelines for this process? Well, I think we need to, A, wait out the period from Easter. B, we decide on what metric it is that we are going to use to, uh, to, to decide on what the first step will be. Is that an average number of cases? We're going to get some advice on that over the next couple of days. But then we have to have a plan in place that is ready to roll. And that will um, take different times for different elements of that. Contact tracing is already in place. Um, points of entry control may need to be adjusted and, and, and worked on. And then the question is, what can the modeling tell us about where we should go first in terms of relaxation? Should it be through schools, as people have asked today, and education? Should it be through childcare in the first instance to allow workers the opportunity to go back later for the, 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 the ones we've not identified as essential? So that we're going to work through, and that will be a work in progress pretty well throughout the entire uh, next four or five weeks as we start to roll out this and then evaluate what we've done because some jurisdictions are making one change and then waiting two weeks and then seeing what happens before they make any other change. And we need to decide, is that a way we want to go to? A lot of questions and all we're going to be able to provide, I think, when we start is a couple of next best first steps because no one else has gone down this road. Um, PEI is just slightly ahead of us. Norway and Denmark are a little bit further ahead, but there is no road manual. There is no, there is no guidebook to do this. So we're going to have to find a Newfoundland and Labrador solution. Thank you, Minister. We'll now play our new animation video, and we invite everybody to tune in again tomorrow at 2 p.m., 1.30 in Labrador. Operator, please do not end this call at 2.59 p.m. Thank you.